Yo, you know anybody that played in the league before? NBA, NFL, MLB. Well, guess what? This is the episode for you, and this is the episode for them. Today, we discuss making a pivot from the league to business, how that impacts you and the people around you. So make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And tune in with us. We appreciate your love and support. Thank you. I want to say pivot and right. We got to have life conversations earlier. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, a lot of the guys I went to school, I can recall them uh, getting like university funding and taking that funding, right, and sending a bunch of it back home. Um, and all through the locker room, all you hear is, I got to make it for my mama, man. My mama pushing me, my mama pushing mm -hmm. me. But the thing is, we as African Americans, we gotta push our kids in something other than sports. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can still make a lot of money in corporate America, starting your own business, but we as African Americans, we so bottled in on, hey, you gotta play football, you gotta mm -hmm. play basketball. So at the end of the day, that's all we know. That's all we knew. Um, I mean, my pops was financially in corporate, my pops was did great in financial, uh, in corporate America. Retired mm -hmm. at 48, doesn't have to work wow. again. Um, but I can recall him pushing me in sports, right? And not and not many two other not other things outside of that. Right. And no disrespect to my pops. Amazing right. man. Like I look up to him, I want to be everything he is. That was your reality. Um, but that was the reality. Right. And that's why with my son, a lot of people are like, oh, do you make him play sports? I'm like, no, I don't make him do anything. He wants to play because I played. But then again, like he has no pressure to make it because I got I got him, I got my my soon to be wife, I got me, right. I got all of us. So he has no pressure to make it for us. Right. So if he wants to play and make it, it's strictly on him. The greatest, the greatest. I'm a star shine bright like neon. neon. The new space jam like LeBron. LeBron. I'm out of this world like Elon, 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 Elon. What's the catch up, it'll take a eon. eon. Prime time nigga like Dion. Dion. I'm out of this world like Elon, 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 Elon. Musk. I'm a star shine bright like neon. neon. The new space jam like LeBron. LeBron. I'm out of this world like Gentlemen, gentlemen, guests, ladies, everybody, thank you. Welcome back to another segment of Black Fly on the Wall podcast. We, we got some special guests today, um, you know. Uh, some some legends. Some we got too many people from Durham. I can tell you that much. <laughs> never, never too many people you can from never Durham. Add too many people. <laughs> Way <laughs> too many people from Durham, <laughs> man. <laughs> so, two five. All you can do, all you need is one of them. <laughs> but to, to my right, I have Desmond Scott. Desmond, go ahead and introduce yourself, man. What's going on, everybody? I appreciate y'all for being here. Thank you guys for being here as well. Desmond Scott from Durham, North Carolina, aka Boy City. Um, business owner of Prime Institute in Raleigh and Garner. Nice, nice, nice. The legend. T tell them, tell them about Duke too, man. Oh, Duke. Oh man. Uh, ACC and Duke record holder. First person in Duke history to have a thousand yards rushing, receiving, and kickoff return. Absolutely. Third person in ACC history to do that. Absolutely. Nice legend. To my left, got Mr. Tony Creasy here. And that, he a regular now. <laughs> Tell yeah, me about yourself. Um, Tony Creasy, man, from Durham, North Carolina, a.k.a. the Bull City. Uh -huh. uh, got to represent it everywhere we go. Um, as always, man, father, follower of Christ, business owner, uh, fiance, uh, everything, one of them one. Nice, nice. And to, to my far left here, another legend, uh, Carlos Fields. Carlos, introduce yourself. Uh, I know a lot of people from Bull City, oh. a.k.a. <laughs> North Carolina. Um, former, uh, um, you know, I went to one seven state. Um, played yes, linebacker sir. Round pride. Um, I think our record was 40, 46 and forty six and six. Um, while I was there, played in a national championship. Um, nice. Um, math teacher, uh, husband, father. Nice. Um, all of that in one. Yeah. Yeah. So, love. Yeah. Love. 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 And today's episode is pivoting from the league to business. You know, I felt this was a very important conversation to have as a lot of our peers played professionally, whether it was the NBA, NFL, college athletes that chose a different path mm -hmm. other than going professional. Um, I feel like this is a very, in, very, very important conversation to have. One, for the other individuals that um, made the same choices that you all made. Two, um, had the same experiences that you all have. But three, most importantly, this conversation is for the young kids out there that 
may one day and will one day, whether they go to the league and play 20 years, 20 years, or they go to the league and play two years, or they choose a different route other than going to the NBA, NFL, MLB, whatever it may be, everybody's going to come to a point where you have a critical point in your life where you have to pivot. And you have to pivot for yourself. you got to pivot for your family. you got to pivot for your own life purpose legacy. And I think I feel like it was a very important conversation to have. So I had to have some gentlemen that have experienced it, you know. And my goal is just to guide the conversation. So, uh, Des, kick it off, man. To tell us, uh, you know, shortly about your experience as a, as a college athlete at the top of their game and how the experience of pivoting was important for you. Yeah, man. Uh, it was definitely a blessing for me to uh, experience everything that I got to experience through football. Yeah. Um, the, the, the places that it took me, the people that I met, um, and the platform that it created for mm -hmm. me. Um, was, was a blessing beyond what I can actually comprehend as a 18 year old. Um, but looking back now as a 30 year old business owner um, to utilize that platform of football to be able to do the things that I do now and impact the people that I've been able to impact. Um, I, was, I was able to make a decision to walk away from football, uh, much rather football ending for me um, I could walk away from it and, and start the journey of uh, becoming a teacher and a principal. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah. Nice. That, that, so, you, so you had a you had a unique situation because you were able to choose your decision to step away versus it impacting you and you having to kind of be reactive. You were more so proactive. Yeah, for with sure. That, with yeah. that. Yeah. Tony, what about your experience? So I was opposite. Um, I was more reactive, um, and my reaction. Uh, wasn't the best. Uh, growing up, man, like, I was the number one or number two player in the state, like, 16th in the country. Offers from anybody, you name it, I had it. Um, so at this point in life, I'm, I'm the man. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I am Tony Creasy. Mm -hmm. That's me. I'm the man. And uh went to college, uh, got hurt, so I registered my freshman year. Registered freshman year, was started going crazy. Registered sophomore year, started going crazy. Uh and then that's when my life kind of took a, a turn, because at that point um, it was it was then about women, it was then about um, it, it it more so went from football to to now like I'm just this man, and uh, so I was reactive. So luckily um, I stopped playing as much, um, but then I had a shot to go to the Patriots. I uh, took that opportunity, uh, made it to the last cuts. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, yeah, yeah, yeah Dez mm -hmm. was training me. That's the crazy part. <laughs> yeah. Dez was training oh, wow. me. Wow, small world. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that was my trainer. So it was crazy. I remember Bill Belichick called me and I was like, hey, man, like, uh, you deserve to be in the league. You're a great player. Thank you so much. Uh, we enjoyed your time here, but we just don't need you right now. So I'm like, I understood that. Mm -hmm. And my agent kept calling me, hey, man, this team asking about you, this team asking about you, this team asking about you. So during that time, I took a little job where I was making minimal money. Like I wasn't making money at all, but I wanted to train and still try to make it right. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just, my life just started spiraling because then the call stopped coming. Right. And I'm still making, I think I was making, what, $11 an hour or something. Okay. I, I was like, I'm going to chase this football dream. Life was spiraling out of control, spiraling out of control. Um, and then it got to the point where I, I had depression. I wasn't like that. I didn't do teaching. I didn't, and then able to start his own business. I, I, mm -hmm. I had a point of depression where I was like, man, like, because my name was always associated with football. Right. Mm -hmm. And I thought in order to have this lavish life that I wanted, I had to play football. I mm -hmm. had to make millions of dollars. But as we said on a couple episodes ago, it ain't about how much money you make. It's how you manage that money. Absolutely. So, uh, man, I had a state of depression, man. Like That's understandable. At some points, man, I felt like I was I wanted to kill myself because uh, I, I wasn't that guy anymore. I wasn't mm -hmm. Tony Creasy. I was mm -hmm. a regular guy now. And I was like, I, di I didn't think I could make a great living as I do now off working in corporate America um, and what I have. So that's, that's, that's all I can say journey. about it. It's a man. journey, man. It, it was, it's a journey. It's, it's a journey. Story. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's yeah. a testament though, uh, to how you, 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 uh, introduced yourself. Yeah. Right. You said a follower of a Christ, a father, um, a fiance, right? So that is who you are now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the thing is, that's who you were then. You just had to go through a journey to understand what those titles were. 
Absolutely. And the roles um, that you had to play within them. Yeah, yeah. That's nice. exactly it, man. I remember uh, just speaking about when Dez was training me, man. Like, what's, and, I, and this is just not, I never told him this, and this isn't to promote his business. This is me being truthful. Um, I remember I was training, and, and half of the times, a lot of the times, I would say, more than half, I want to say, he, he was always talking about God, always leading us to God, talking about what God has done for him. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things where when I hit my hard point, I'm like, I don't have anybody to lean on. And all I remember is Dad's always talking about God, God, God. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, who's this guy? Let me go try to lean on him real quick and see right. where that takes me. Right. Um, and, man, I'm here today um, and, and able to tell this story, more than happy to tell this story uh, when a lot of guys will shy away from the opportunity. Um, I love to sit down and talk about this. It's, it's important. It's important, man. And I think it shows a true testament to where black men are today to accept and take on that challenge of vulnerability. You know what I mean? Sometimes men are embarrassed by – you know, their failures, their ups, their downs. We talked earlier about wins and losses. But I think it's a two testament. So kudos to you all and definitely pat yourself on the back for having the courage to come forth and have that discussion. Because yeah. it's always a talk about being at the top of your game and where you are winning at. But it's very few conversations about, you know what, when things didn't happen the way that I wanted them to, this is how I dealt with them yeah. from a truthful, honest place. And Carlos, tell us your experience. Yeah, so I, I think for me, um, my journey was a lot different from, um, for me, I was a little under the radar a little bit, um, which is which is cool. Um, for one, I wanted to go to an HBCU, and I wanted to go to a Division One school. Um, so coming out of school, you know, it was just something that kind of, you know, fell in my lap, really. Wow. Um, I always yeah. knew I wanted to be an athlete um, because my mom, and I probably talk about her a, a lot on, on this show um, because she's like my motivator, my, my rock. She's pretty much everything. She plays sports, you know, was – Hall of Fame at um, Fayetteville State um, huh? University in basketball, track, and softball. Wow. Um, so she's like, you know, the person that pretty much who made me who I am today. Um, but, you know, me growing up, man, in high school, you know, I, it was not more so of just being a great, you know, football player or being this great, um, you know, athlete. It was just something that I was, like, technically good at. Um, um, so I ended up going to Winston-Salem State. Um, you know, becoming a four-year starter there, um, and and pretty much, man, you know, it just kind of went from there. And um, just from moving, you know, transitioning to the league, um, it was just a, a, a lot of things that, you know, I had to adapt um, because coming from an HBCU, Division two HBCU to the National Football League, it's, it's, it's different. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a lot different versus we're talking about speed, we're talking about size, we're right. talking about – just overall um, um, philosophies of of, of the game of, of the game of football, yeah. um, because when you're talking about black college, there's a black quarterback. He can run. He can he can you know scramble. But in in the league, it was more so of dissecting the defense. It wasn't more so of just you know scrambling out of the pocket or if my first read is not there or my second read is not there, I may have to try to do a check down or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it was um, more so for me. Um, just, just being able to adapt to, you know, that college world versus, you know, that NFL world. Nice, nice. Los, I got a question for you, man. Tell me, to me. tell me about the HBCU experience, man. I didn't get that experience, right? Yeah, I went yeah. to a PWI. I wanted to um, transfer, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> boy, hey, boy. Legendary, I remember, baby. I used to go to, uh, I used to, my sister just gave Creasy was always on the show. Uh, you graduated from uh -huh. Salem State, Yeah, too. Salem State. Man, man, I think I used to be at their homecoming more than my own. So, man, tell me about that, man. Let me, I, I want to hear a little bit about um, that. So, for me, um, like I said, my mom went to Fayetteville State, so I kind of had that background. When I was like a jit, I was like five, six years old, mm -hmm. going back to the to the to the Bronco land and seeing the band, seeing the football, uh, seeing the football team, seeing the basketball team, seeing the CIAA basketball tournament from when I was a little kid. So that was really a dream that I always wanted to have. Yeah. 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 Um, but just the love, the camaraderie, um, the, the the school size. Um, just thinking about Duke or thinking about NC State, you may have thirty thousand. 15,000, 20 people at that school, you know, so I'm thinking about a class size, you know, at 300, 200 people versus at a smaller 6,000 population school where, you know, I'm in class, I know my, I know my professor, um, you know, I can hit my professor up right then and there and she can, you know, email me back versus exactly. you being in a crowd of 200 people mm -hmm. and she don't even know your name. Yeah. Um, so just that love, that camaraderie, that, 
that uh, the passion that the teacher um, student um, you know related. You know, it's just, and then you know, frats. Um, I know right. that's uh, Aaron, a Aaron is uh, um, in, yeah. the, in the wrong frat. Oh, you know, <laughs> but just you know, you're 1911, man. man. You just yeah. later on that gotcha, year, gotcha. you're too late, too little, too um, late, just, too you know, late. Fraternities, um, <laughs> D9. I mean, it's just, you know, it's it's it's, it's love. Man. Yeah, it's love. you know, like the, the HBCU experience is like. I don't know what you can compare it to. But this is the thing, though. Me and Tony got it in high school. Yeah, okay. that's, that's true, too. Girl. That's true, too. We, we got it in high school. Yeah, North Carolina Central. Yeah, so, no, no, no. At, 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 at Hillside. Hillside. Oh, Hill, Hillside. Southern. Okay. That was our HBCU. That's your HBCU. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we got it in high school. Both legendary schools, Yeah, man. man. Um, but but you're right, though. Like, I, I legit, man, Duke was hard. Duke was hard coming from, you talked about college to the league high school to a, a big time D one was hard where I could go to Fridays, TGI Fridays and see my coaches at the bar. Gee. Bro, my coaches in college, dude, <laughs> we would walk past each other and barely speak. Jeez. Like it was a different kind wow. of dynamic. Wow. It was a business. Wow. Yeah. Truly a it business. Was a business. Wow. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why, why I, wasn't as successful because it, it wasn't it wasn't too fun to me anymore, right? Um, it was more of a business. I'm like, man, this is like he said, you can walk by a coach, a coach, he won't even speak to you. It's like, wow, you're not really, a, it's it's not really a, um, you're not really together, right? It's more, it's literally a business. Yeah, it's, I, not, it's not what you, it's not what you for what you think is going to be whenever you were a kid. The, yeah, the, the coaches they do a very good job creating a facade of what they they want you to believe that school is going to be like. Um, but they don't do a good job cultivating okay. the facade okay. that they that they give to you as a as a high school kid when they're recruiting you. Okay, um, when you walk on that on that campus, it's put it to you this way: Scotty Montgomery probably recruited both of y'all at Duke. Um, I was so unaware of the dynamic of having position coaches. I didn't meet my position coach. Until I walked on campus. Whoa. Yeah. Because I didn't know. Like when you were in high school, it's like, no, nah, this is just my coach. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, he he's my running back coach, but he just the coach yeah. to me. <laughs> but when I got to college, it really I saw, oh, this is a linebacker's coach. Yep. This is a running mm -hmm. back's coach. Mm -hmm. This is a re receiver's coach. I didn't meet, and I pretty pretty sure they did that on purpose. I didn't meet my position coach until I walked on campus. Wow. What do you what what y'all think? What's the purpose of that? For me, I mean, it was a white guy that never played running back. Like, okay, okay. Hey, how how are you gonna coach me on something that you've never done? I like, always, yeah. you know, I always looked at that like, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and and you know, it, it, it's a game that the coaches have been playing for a long time, and they know how to win. Carlos, did you did you experience that same thing at HBCU, or do you, was yeah. it a different experience? No, definitely not. Um, I think for me and the coaches at Winston Salem State, um, and I was fortunate enough to have my same set of coaches the whole four years. Um, um, when I went to Winston Salem State, we were Division One, but then that next year we we went down to Division Two, okay, NCAA. Mm -hmm. um, and once that new once that new wave of coaches came in, it was like wow, like you know. And it was it was it was it was sort of like a balance, like this person that gave you tough love, this person that you can go to to talk about life, this person that you can talk to to go talk about um, academics. Mm -hmm. um, but it was basically a family to where everybody, you know, did their part. And it wasn't just the running backs with the running backs, the linebackers with the linebackers. It was everybody, you know, the linebackers coach may go and talk to somebody's parents about, you know, whatever. Um, okay. But it was more so, like I said, that family at that HBCU, HBCU level is just tremendous to me. Absolutely. And I would love to, you know, think about going to a Duke or a Carolina or something like that. But for me, coming out of high school, I just always wanted to be comfortable and be around people that look like me um, versus, um, you know, going to an area where, you know, I'm, I'm foreign, which when I came from Division Two or, or HBCU and went to the league, it was, it was different. And he said two things that stood out to me. Uh, one, I'm gonna speak on the the family thing, like, and overall all aspects of a, a PWI. I, mean, I remember when uh, I was there when Obama was president, and uh, it was to the point, man, where one time 
we were walking to the Free Expression Tunnel, which is like well, on NC State's campus. You can write, paint anything in this tunnel. Okay. And I remember they had Obama's face, and it was like racist remarks around it. Wow. And I was at a PWI. Right. So I'm like, yo, like, this is crazy. Right. Like, this would never happen right. at an HBCU. Oh, absolutely not. Um, and it was to the point where it's like, we're playing in front of we're playing in front of y'all 40, 50,000, right? Mm -hmm. Y'all love us then, mm -hmm. but let something go wrong and then mm -hmm. they hate you. Mm -hmm. um, another thing he said, he had the same coach for four years. Man, I had two different head coaches and I think three or four different position coaches. I was there four years. Right. So it was essentially like, man, I, every year I had a new coach. Right. So, um, so it sounds like the theme is really the lack of rapport. Yeah. Whenever it comes down from, you know, playing at a PWI and playing at an HBCU. Yep. Now, to shift things a little bit more, um, how did you examine yourself uh, post your professional and college careers? Like, was there a new development of skill that you now had to develop now that you were transitioning? Like, Dez, you mentioned um, becoming a principal and transitioning and being a teacher. Is that something that you studied in college? How did you come into that path? Yeah, so I, I, I actually double majored in history, African-American studies, and an education okay. minor. So that was my path from the get-go. Okay. Um, I had a, um, a very impactful social studies teacher in sixth grade um, who, who uh, planted a seed in me to, to go in that direction for my career. Um, and so that's where I was headed the entire time. But, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I really did have to do some self-evaluating because I was presented with the question um, in my latter years um, but I'm pretty sure it had something to do with me being a younger man of who are you? It's a famous right? question. Like, yeah. who are you? It's famous. I heard that one a lot. Man. And I couldn't answer it. Mm -hmm. Right. I no longer had Desmond Scott, the football player. Yeah. yeah, I was a business owner. That was cool. But like, who are you? And so I had to go on a journey to find out who I was. Obviously, I'm a follower of Christ. Like, we, yeah, we know that, but who are you? Mm -hmm. What brings you joy? Anita Baker. Um, <laughs> uh, and I had to find out that. And once I found that out, then I was able to proceed Absolutely. or, you know, continue on my, my life journey. But for all of us, football was who we were. And that's what brought us joy. We played football literally every day from age five until we stopped mm -hmm. um, year round. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Tony talks about depression. That is a real thing. Like, that is real. When you literally, it's, it's a death. Wow. Right? It's a death because it's something that you no longer have, no longer you can touch. Right? You're no longer around You're no longer it. putting the cleats on. You're yeah. No longer. Like, I didn't watch it on TV. Once, wow. I, once I finished playing, I couldn't watch it on yeah. TV. Yeah. I couldn't. The, the, the things that brought me joy was training. Right? Like, seeing Tony go to the paper, like, that brought me joy. Right, so you found you found a new motivation, yeah. and a new joy, mm -hmm. versus directly uh, relating it to yourself. Right. Right. And when we speak about go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. okay. Go ahead. When we speak about pivoting, man, like um, I think that that's got to start. I don't even want to say pivoting, right? We got to have life conversations earlier, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of the guys I went to school, I can recall them uh, getting like university funding and taking that funding, right, and sending a bunch of it back home. Um, and all through the locker room, all you hear is, I got to make it for my mama, man. My mama pushing me, my mama pushing mm -hmm. me. But the thing is, we as African Americans, we got to push our kids in something other than sports. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can still make a lot of money in corporate America, starting your own business, but we as African Americans, we so bottled in on, hey, you got to play football, you got to mm -hmm. play basketball. So at the end of the day, that's all we know. That's all we knew. Um, I mean, my pops was financially in corporate America. My pops was did great in financial uh, in corporate America. Retired mm -hmm. at 48, doesn't have to work wow. again. Um, but I can recall him pushing me in sports, right? And not and not many two other not other things outside right. of that. Right. And no disrespect to my pops, amazing right. man. Like I look up to him. I want to be everything he is. That was a reality. Um, but that was the reality. Right. And that's why with my son, a lot of people are like, oh, do you make him play sport? I'm like, no, I don't make him do anything. He wants to play because I played. But then again, like he has no pressure to make it because I got I got him. I got my, my soon-to-be wife, I got me, right. I got all of us. So he has no pressure to make it for us. Right. So if he wants to play and make it, it's strictly on him. Right. And, you know, I had a, I had a conversation with a patient uh, earlier last week on um, the importance of putting your kids in educational-related camps 
And she was like, my son wants to play basketball. You know, he wants to do this. He wants to do that. And I said, you know, have you um, heard of the North Carolina STEM camp for kids? Yeah. I said, if you if you push your sons to be smart in science, technology, and math, you will see their intelligence heighten at a, at a very, very rapid pace. Exactly. I said, that will then give them multiple opportunities because the world is science, technology, <laughs> and math. And math <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> I said, so I said, so you as a parent no, no longer have to worry about your child um, and what pi- what they may pivot to whenever they're in college or what they may take up because they will learn that those things are fun. And she was like really, you know, really taken aback by that and really was like, wow, I really need to do research on these camps. So I said, yeah, when he finishes up his basketball camp in the summer, send him to STEM camp yeah. mm-hmm. because that'll give him the balance that he needs. And right. Los, how was your experience, um, you know, as far as developing new skills and for your new professional yeah, career. Yeah, so I, I think my 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 all time um, greatest you know ex, uh, you know attribute is probably to critically think mm-hmm. um, because in math, man, you got to be able to remember a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. And when I think about remembering, I think about looking at film. I'm looking at okay, is this guy is, is he pulling? Um, look at the receiver stance. What does he do in this type of stance? Looking at the offensive lineman, where hey, if this offensive lineman is hands up. It's probably going to be a pass if his hand is down. If he's cocked a little bit, he's probably pulling. So just being able to critically, um, critically think um, was like one of my greatest assets. Absolutely. And he talked about um, just being depressed. Um, so for me, my 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 dream goal um, was to be a math teacher. Um, my mom was a, was a, was a thirty year uh, thirty year vet. Um, so I, I like the NFL, MLB, NF, uh, um, um, NBA. That was really not a talk in Henderson, North Carolina. Um, right. You know, my dream job was to, hey, go to school, um, be a role model to, you know, X, Y, or Z, and, you know, build them up like my coaches did me, like my teachers did me. Um, so just going to the league was it was kind of like a blessing, um, but it was my, my blessing is now. Right. Um, because when you get emails at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning from a student that, you'd be like, man, I just really want to just jack you up. Like saying, <laughs> after you graduate, you know, thank you, you know, Coach Fields, Mr. Fields, for, you know, staying on me, for, you know, sending me or calling mom because I've, I've done this, telling me to pull my pants up, telling me to, you know, just carry yourself as a, as a, as a gentleman. Absolutely. Um, so right now I'm living my, my dream. Your um, purpose. Yep. And, you know, I think where a lot of people um, – not really, because you know money. Money is pretty much the root of all evil, mm-hmm. right? And for me, I, w- I always wanted to just live comfortable. Not really just to make a million dollars, two million dollars, three million dollars, but you know, like my junior senior, my, my junior year, I could. I was like, okay, maybe I could, maybe I could do something. Okay, oh, you was killing, you was killing it, your junior. That's a movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you the but, man, boy. But it, was, but, but it was a, it was a, it was a great stepping stone, and it was a kickstarter to we had where to I am today. But right, right now, it's, it's definitely where right. I'm. Right. Uh, well, I, I want to be. You know, also, my, my question for you boys are is, how was it dealing, we talked about, like, depression. How was the pressure of not living up to the expectations of people around you, not of yourself? Because that's something that you probably dealt with consistently. But it was people around Dez that had big dreams and aspirations mm-hmm. for Dez. Yeah. It was the people around Carlos that had big dreams. The same, same for you, Tony. It's people that thought more about, you playing in the league more than you did. Like they saw you rushing for whatever yeah. NFL team <laughs> or you playing linebacker for X amount of NFL teams. And so like, how was it the pressure of not living up to the expectations of other people? So I think by both of them being fathers, I think my dad did a very good job at um, buffering uh, the sports world for me, right? Um, he gave me everything that these people gave me. So it didn't really matter what they said to me because my dad was already telling me. Right. So yeah. if me and him were good, I really didn't care that's, that's solid. what they had to say. Uh, and so when I was able to, you know, tell him, like, look, I don't want to play football. He was good with it. That's all that mattered. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think like being a father, it starts with that relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I didn't do interviews. My dad did all of my interviews until he felt like I was capable enough to hold a conversation that didn't, that made me sound intelligent. 
Okay. Right. So okay. he was that kind of buffer. For okay. Me. Okay. Nice. So I, I was totally different. Um, my pops was the same way though. My pops was a realist. Tell me what I'm doing great. Tell me what I'm doing bad. But Desmond, Desmond, a little bit older than me. So by the time, I'm not saying he's super old, but while I was in college, <laughs> social media was a thing. Social yeah, media was right. huge. That's when it had blown up. Okay. So. Um, the fact that you can post a highlight on something and somebody mm -hmm. sees it, see you go crazy, you get all these fans and followers. So for me, I think as I look back on it, I think that's where most of my depression came from is I didn't live up to what people expected me to be. Right. I think that's where my depression came from because who isn't happy about making it to the NFL, right? Um, and I didn't see it that way. I was like, dang, bro, I'm finna get cut. I'm gonna go back home. Everybody gonna be talking about me. So mm -hmm. um, that pressure for me was was one of the things that sent me into depression because I just didn't know which move I was gonna make. I didn't know what people was gonna think of me. What could I've What could I've done for you? Nothing, bro. Um, I, you're one of the reasons why I came out of that depression mm. with us talking about God, with you um, just pouring into me. Because you used to be like, bro, you got it, you got it, and and that's one of the things that black men don't do is tell you you got it or tell you how they got it. We mm -hmm. want to bottle it. We want to do it in, hey, you need to go do this, but you, you won't set the foundation of how that person did it, right? So, um, and I think that's what Desmond did a great job at is, nice. is during those times where um, I would want to tap out. He'd be like, hey, what's your goal? Like, what you here for? Mm -hmm. It takes um, a village. Yeah, it takes a village. It, it really village. does. That, that was just, I was, I was about to say that. Um, for me, it started when I was in high school. Um, from choosing an HBCU over an ECU, over a Duke, over a Carolina, where I'm having people in my ear, like, you know, even family members sometimes, like, you better go to that big school. Right. Why are you uh -huh. choosing? Because you're going to get more exposure, you're mm -hmm. going to get more TV time, you're going to get. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, I, I, was, I was always taught if you're good, they're going to find you. Absolutely. You know, Division three, you know, Pierre Garcon, uh, um, NAI, you got Division two, which John Brown, which I'm. Um, he actually, John Brown is a receiver that went to Pittsburgh State. If we would have won my junior year, we would have played them in, in, in college. Okay. But, you know, him being drafted in the third, third round, um, Janoris Jenkins, which obviously he was at Florida, he was at Florida first, but then he ended up going to one of the Division II schools. But he got drafted, mm -hmm. you know, fourth, fifth round. But um, just being able to have that that strong support system um, and only and not listening to people, you know, in, in one ear and the other thinking about, well, hey, you need to do this because this looks well. Absolutely. You, you're the only person that can live that that dream. So um, for me, it was just, hey, it was HBCU and it wasn't nothing else. And a yeah. quick point to that, what I'm noticing, too, in the shift, you mentioned social media, you mentioned choosing the school. You know, Deion Sanders is trying to make that change right yeah. now. You know, Prime is really trying to get kids to understand is it don't matter where you go. It matters what you Play do right crazy. here. Yeah. Definitely. You know yeah. what I mean? Definitely. When you stand up, you are probably about two, two and a half feet wide. And what you do with your feet and your hands yep. is what's going to push your trajectory. Absolutely. You can go to a USC or Florida State or Florida, but if you don't work hard, you're not going to make it. Right. Yeah. It don't matter where you are. And so where he's at at Jackson State trying to recruit all these guys, he's recruiting guys that's that's choosing Jackson State over a Florida State, yep. over yep. over a Alabama or wherever, just to play for an individual who's such a pillar in the NFL community, mm -hmm. as being a man that you've seen him work hard. Mm -hmm. He's considered arguably, probably in some, some people's eyes, the best cornerback that played the game. Exactly, yeah. And he put in the effort. He did the flashiness, but he was able to back up all the stuff that he said, exactly. you know? And so I, that's, I just want to make that point to, to highlight the con what you were saying, Los, about the HBCUs and, and the shift that the game is taking right now. We're seeing it in the NBA where guys are saying, you know what? Why am I gonna go to the you know, go to uh, play b college ball if now I can go to the G League, play against mm -hmm. professionals, and get paid a million dollars or mm -hmm. half a million dollars to do it? So the shift is is happening. Roy Williams retired. Yeah. Coach, Coach K, K is retiring. retiring. Mm -hmm. You know the Blue Bloods are no longer the top dogs anymore, and so now what we got to start seeing is just you know every dog has their day, yeah. Yeah. and there's there's always going to be a shift whether it's in college football, college basketball, NBA, NFL. On where people are, everybody's having to pivot. Yep. Right now, even these young boys coming out of school, that since they were kids, saying they're gonna play for Coach K, that's impossible now. Yeah. Yeah. So now, if you if you continue to identify yourself with things that 
may not be as attainable anymore. You have to make sure that you have the foundation, which is what I'm hearing from you guys. Is the is the kind of the 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 the, the theme of the message is the foundation that you have. The yeah. last question that I have for you guys is: Overall, how did your competitive edge help in your new career? Because you all play college ball, so that means that you're almost it runs competitiveness runs yeah. in your blood, evidently. <clears throat> like Des, you have the the gems now, so that's that's your competitive spirit transitioning over into your business life. Los, you talked about your passion with the kids. You're competitive and making sure your kids graduate, go to college, stay out of trouble, you know, turn away gang violence, yada, yada, yada. And, Tony, we talked multiple times about how quickly you excelled in your company. Yeah. It had to be your competitive edge and your competitive spirit when doing so. So how did that, how did that, how did that take a part and take a play in, in your professional life? It, it made a huge – it made a huge impact. Just as Los was saying how – uh, watching film, right? He he said uh, he was able to see what a receiver may do, mm -hmm. what a what a lineman may do, um, and then just being so particular in that aspect from watching film carried over to his real. Same with us. So literally, same with me. I should say, literally, all the time while I watch film and notice the small things um, which make the bigger picture. That's how I, I, I approach mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. uh, all the small things make a bigger picture. Absolutely. Um, before we go though. I gotta give a shout out to my sister, uh, Jessica El Creasy, man. Uh oh, um, oh, that cheesing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't let us go without that, man, because she was, she was ahead of the game before we even got to this point of high athletes going to HBCUs. Mm -hmm. So when I was coming out, she was trying to push me to go to Winston Salem State. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I got a shout out, man, because yeah. uh, even when I was going through that depression, man, like. I talked about my pops a lot, man, but that girl right there, she, she held me down during them times. Her so. little self held you yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> her little self held me down. So, but yeah, man, just to, I'm sorry, I had to, I had to get no, that out. No. But uh, just to get back on topic, just man, just all the small things like the leadership uh, abilities, the, the hard work, the just all those abilities uh, that you learn in college. Mm -hmm. um, truly, trans, those tra trans transitional yeah, skills. Truly what about transition. You, yeah. yeah, for me, man, my competitive edge. And, and willingness to work um, almost uh, turned my business upside down because what I noticed was it was a lot of people who couldn't work as hard as we work. Yeah. Mm. Right. And, <laughs> and, and people didn't like it. People don't like being pushed. Oh no. Nah. People don't like being nah. pushed, nah. whether it's your clients, whether it's your employees, um, and so I had to figure out how to take my competitive edge and my work ethic and and give it to people in doses, right? Because for, for us, That's a bar. if my coach would be like, yo, go run through a wall, <laughs> bet he's telling me I can run through a wall. So there must be a reason for me to be, or there may be, a, there must be a way for me to actually run, run through, through that wall, wall. Okay. Yeah. right? So my response is going to be like, all right, cool, where I tell an employee run through a wall, they're going to be like, well, that's a wall. Um, is there a particular point of the wall that I need to run into? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> do I need a certain amount of speed? Like, mm -hmm. nah, figure it out on your own and go run through the wall. And for me, I took that, um, that competitive edge and, and that willingness to work and built this business. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it, came from me working all the time, but now it's transitioning into me being a smarter businessman and understanding people and what they need uh, and how and how to get them to move and work. Um, but it almost it almost took the business yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm I'm, I'm learning I'm learning that with my my level of communication with my siblings mm -hmm. It's like I have to learn how to when to push. And when to listen, you know, and and that's something new just based off my upbringing. Like I was raised by a single mom and I'm the oldest. So yeah. excuses, there were no <laughs> exceptions. Yeah, This needs to be done and it needs to be done in a timely manner. And if we don't have no time for how do I do this, if ands bust about it. And so it got me to where I am at a very high rate, but I sacrifice how I see life. Like I can't, I've learned that I can't put the no excuses thing on everybody yeah. because yeah. everybody just ain't built the same. Yeah. You know, everybody, go ahead. 
I want to make a point. Carlos mentioned watching film, right? In film session, if we watching practice, if we watching the game, coach is going to sit there with his little red button, mm -hmm. say, Carlos, why you ain't take the step, read the step you were supposed to take, mm -hmm. right? Do better. And it's a, it's a room full of 13 other linebackers at that time, and he's literally critiquing you in that moment. You can't say nothing else, mm -hmm. right? Yes, sir. Yeah, right. yes, sir. Like, who <laughs> that next time? <laughs> so – I say that to say because that can get us in trouble when dealing with our women, right? If our women didn't come from an environment where it was, this is where you messed up at, do better, and they had the opportunity to express themselves mm -hmm. and say, oh, well, but this is why I did it, mm -hmm. right? We didn't come from that, yeah, right? right. And so we got to <laughs> be a little bit softer right. Right. with our women to give them the ability to say, "Well, babe, this is why I was, this is why I did it. I I know you're telling me I'm wrong, but this is why I did it. Don't you want to hear why I did it? Where I nah, I don't really care why you did it. It right. was wrong. <laughs> Do it better than oh, next. Yeah. Story, story of my life, yeah. man. Yeah. No, it's story. Just, just kind of picking back off of that. Um, you know, just that competitive edge of um, you know, watching film and just being like the greatest athlete that you can that, that you can be. Um, for me, the hardest thing to do is to get a 16-year-old kid that's been doing something for so long to change his mindset, to change how he thinks, change, just basically change his whole philosophy about life. Mm -hmm. um, right now, um, you know, I teach eighth grade, and, you know, the cool thing is now is to sag, is to, uh, you know, be about gangs affiliations fight and you know drama i mean that's by far i mean it's harder than you know if this guy goes out this guy's coming in hey on a on an out route i got to keep right. his inside leverage and right. i can't let him beat me inside like this is way more harder mm -hmm. than just dissecting the game of football being a teacher oh man you're a motivator you're your 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 teacher your you have dad. to know your your dad yeah. now, i mean some people don't even have that like when like the the the, the county that I that, that I teach in, which is Thomasville City, they're literally raising themselves wow. at 13, 14, 15 years old. Sad, man. So I'm the only person that can lead them to the war. And so that, and you, that's a lot of pressure and accountability that you're putting on yourself, Definitely. too. And so as and to wrap this conversation up, like in all, I think the as we go back to it and as we talked about it earlier, is the self-love, loving yourself, putting yourself first, because the more and more you take care of you, the more you can give to everybody else. Yeah. Like Des, you got the new gym, you got your second location open. You got to take care of you so that you can be an efficient businessman. Tony, same thing with you. You got to be. You got to take care of you to be an efficient father and fiance. And same thing with you, Los, an efficient father, husband, and teacher, and guiding young men into adulthood. So I think all, all in all, like the the theme of pivoting from the league to business is really just. Um, being easier on yourself, um, telling these young kids to uh, make sure that they that they stay true to them yeah. and do it strictly for them. I think Des, that's one thing I picked up specifically from what you were saying is that your father put it in your mind that this is about you, and I'm already impressed, and so you no longer have to impress anybody mm -hmm. else. And so you you making that decision to choose to do that because your your father accepted you as a young black boy. That was something that was critical mm -hmm. for you. And to just think about if he did not accept you for that and push you to, to the NFL, no telling him what the rebuttal would have been yeah. and type of man you would have turned out to be. Right. So all in all, man, thank you guys for, you know, the vulnerability and to, and to pushing the envelope in regards to this pivot. Because 1% uh, of college uh, high school students make it to the NBA and make it to the NFL. Yeah. And so I think that's lesson too. Yeah, it I has. Think it has lesson. It has. I, I mean, the NBA. I, I looked up some statistics, and the NBA is the hardest league to get into because yeah. of the small amount of players. Mm -hmm. And so kids need to be realistic about, you know what? If I tear my ACL, I know I went to the STEM camp. Mm -hmm. I know I'm good at engineering. I know I'm good at all these different things. So I, I'm going to make that pivot and be the MVP of that league. Yeah. MVP of life, yeah. you know. Parents, not we got to be realistic too. Absolutely, yeah. you know, and, and and be honest about your kids' talent yeah. and and to just be responsible. Yeah. So all in all, man, pivoting from the league to business, 
Um, very, very good conversation, and salute to all you all. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate you for having us, man. Sir. No one. It's Aaron, your CEO and producer of Black Fly on the Wall. We appreciate you watching today's episode, but guess what? You can't leave just yet. Come on back. Roll it back in. Make sure you tap that subscribe button. Like, share, subscribe. We appreciate the love. We appreciate the support. It is much gratitude towards you. Make sure you share it with your friends. We're a black man providing black people with premium content. And most importantly, we're providing black men with a safe space to communicate. So what better way to do that other than subscribe to stay up to date with our latest content? We appreciate the love. Make sure you subscribe today. Thank you. Recent college graduate, current HBCU student, do you have the drip? That's an important question. You know why? HBCU drip has some of the most premium content on Instagram in relations to HBCU students and their fashion. It's where fashion meets culture, man. Come on. Of course, I'm a little biased. It's my little brother's page. Make sure you follow and share. And most importantly, ask yourself, do you have the drip?